listen very carefully to the next few words I'm going to speak to you. Right now is a season of time in history where God is doing a very unusual thing. He's doing it right now in the earth. There are upheavals everywhere. It's as if all hell is breaking loose throughout America, throughout Europe, and Asia. The financial markets are experiencing earthquakes and aftershocks that are terrifying the most experienced financial seers. There's terrorism everywhere. People are afraid to even take vacations and trips. I talked to a man who works with us in insurance who's from Dallas, Texas. He's a very wealthy man. He's, he's going to Europe this week. And he three times said to me as he described his trip, he said, we can't let the threat of terrorism stop us from having a vacation. It's like it's in our everywhere we look here's what you've got to understand Satan is concerned and worried as he has never been concerned and worried in the history of this planet he has gotten wind of what God is about to do that's why this morning I want to speak to you on the subject of the coming revival. The coming revival. And I want you right now to lift holy hands. Boy, I'm just into that. I'll just get you lifted hands all service long because I don't think there's anything more wonderful than that. Let's lift our hands. And I want you to say this with me. Living God. Turn with me, please, to the book of Joel. Joel was an obscure prophet who didn't give us a whole lot of information, but what he gave us was vital, especially for this season that we are in. And I want to give you as much of the Word of God as possible. I uh, was yesterday going to speak in Lafayette, and I was going to speak to a group of students. And so I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what would you say to these students if you were me? And this is what the Lord said to me. He said, probably what I've already said. And I turned uh, to the book of John, and I began to talk to these students from the very words of Jesus concerning the power of the Holy Spirit. In Joel, we find one who was able to look through the telescope of prophecy into the very day in which we live. And he was able to describe in vivid detail what he saw God doing in our day. I'll start reading with the 12th verse. Even now, somebody say now. Do you know that everything that God's ever going to do in your life, He's going to do now? You say that sounds like a trivial conclusion until you realize that most of us are God's going to people. God's going to work. God's going to bring me out. God's going to use me. One of these days, I'm going to be used of God. I'm going to see God do. What you have to understand is that everything God does 
He does in the now. God is either working in our lives now or He's not working at all. Even now, say that with me please, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And He relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. Grain offerings, drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. The bridegroom, leave his room and the bride or chamber. Let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the temple porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Here, the prophet is saying in very ancient language and in terminology, but still crystal clear, whatever you're doing, no matter how important, even if you're just about to walk out of the groom's chamber, to take a bride, or to walk out of the bridal room to take a groom. Nothing takes precedence or preeminence over this moment when God is saying, it is time to seek my face. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we are in trouble in America. Right now, everything that we have trusted in has turned to wood, hay, and stubble in our grasp. People are so concerned. Who's going to be the president of the United States? Is it going to be Trump? Is it, is it, is it going to be Cruz? Is, is it going to be Sanders? Is, is it going to be Clinton? Who is going to be the president? Oh, they have such huge responsibilities. I mean, after all, they're going to appoint the Supreme Court justices and and are we going to be able to have a conservative Congress and Senate, or is it going to be more of a liberal Congress and Senate? And are we swinging to the left? Are we swinging to the right? Are we moderates and in the middle? Surely this is the most key and important time in American history because these elections are going to make all the difference in the world. I want you to look at me and listen to me because you heard it here. I can tell you, That America is far too gone for anything to be solved with anybody in the Oval Office or in the Houses of Congress or in the high courts. I can tell you that there is absolutely no hope in the answers and the conclusions of men. America is a place that is in such chaos and turmoil it is frightening even to think about what's happening in this nation our streets are not safe anymore there are thousands of street gangs with memberships of hundreds of thousands throughout America they are violent without conscience and the only thing that matters to them is the almighty dollar that they are able to wrest from the hands of those that are hopelessly addicted in our cities so that they might give it to the cartels right now in America we are the second largest slave holding nation in the world Human trafficking is at an all-time high in this nation. And do you know that while our politicians are arguing like children, refusing to touch the real issues, that human trafficking is not even a plank in anybody's platform in this election. You say, but 
Pastor, you can't lose hope if we can get a conservative court and we can get a conservative Congress and we can get a conservative president. We can turn it all around. You need to hear the words to Zerubbabel, who was a leader that thought he could do it in the arm of flesh. God said to him, listen to me, king. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it is by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. George Bush the first had two conservative houses of Congress. He had a conservative court, and he, of course, was a conservative. And not one thing was done about abortion. Not one thing was done about any conservative issue that is used as campaign fodder to fire the cannons of emotion every time there is an election. Why is that? Because we finally got to come to the conclusion that politicians don't get elected by solving anything. They get elected by allowing it to continue to be a crisis. So the same red flag that they waved before evangelicals four years ago, they can wave before evangelicals right now. And let me just tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not buying it. I'm an American. I believe in the American system. I believe in the Constitution of the United States of America. But it is not in any way, shape, or form my salvation. And it is not the salvation of this nation. The only way that this nation is going to turn around is that King Jesus has got to come to the forefront and we've got to begin to bow down before him, intercede, fast, pray, and believe that God is going to send a genuine spiritual awakening from sea to shining sea. The wind of God has got to begin to blow again. You say, what does that look like? Let me tell you what it looks like. It looks like Joel chapter 2. That's what it looks like. I want to read it to you because it is so powerful. When the pastors finally get tired of being clever and get back between the porch and the altar and being able to cry out, I don't have the slightest idea what to do, Jesus. I'd like for you to show up at my church on Sunday. You haven't been in a while, and I'd just like to open the door and have you come. However that looks, however that feels, it's fine with me because I'm really tired of being clever, and I'm tired of being funny, and I'm, I'm tired of being bright, and I'm, I'm, I'm tired of being relevant, and I'm tired of trying to build a culture. What I'd really like to build for a change is your kingdom that has no end. Church has become just one more exercise in the futility of man trying to justify the fact that we have ripped the power from the engine of the kingdom of God in the name of having numbers of people crowd into an auditorium. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, my goal is not that we fill the house with people that come to see how musical and how talented and how clever we are. I want all that the Word of God has to offer us. And I want Jesus to show up at Shreveport Community Church. May the Word get out in Shreveport, Louisiana and this region. If you go over there on a Sunday morning, I don't know what they're going to sing or whether or not they're going to sing at all. I don't know if the guy's going to preach or he's just going to shout or maybe he's just going to sit down and weep but all I can tell you is this every time you go you're going to see Jesus because Jesus shows up every man and woman in this place needs to understand that while the enemy is doing his best revival is coming I said, revival is coming. There's about to be a clash in America. The evil that you have seen, that you have feared, is a great evil. But there is a greater righteousness that is arising. P. 
People are worried about a civil war. Don't you worry about taking up arms. God already has. We're not worried about the civil war on the earth. We're worried for something that we don't even need to be thinking about. We need to be talking about the war in the heavens, and that one is already won. You know, I, I respect all of our theology, and I know that we pray <laughs> as if everything that is happening depends on us. But ladies and gentlemen, please hear me. This history has already been written. Here's what I want to assure you of. At the end of this history, God is not only alive and well, He's in total control. And I've come to give you good news today. The good news is revival is coming. Let's continue to read. Then the Lord will be jealous for his land. Say these words with me. Then the Lord will. Turn to the person next to you and say, he will. The Lord will reply. Hallelujah. If we cry out to God, I said the Lord will reply. Lift your hands right now. How many of you want to see a revival come? How many of you believe the word when it says the Lord will reply? I want you right now to ask him. I want you to say, Lord, will you send a revival? Lord, will you make me a part of it? Hallelujah. Now just lift your hands and praise him and give him glory. Because you know what's happening right now? He's replying. He's replying. And his answer is yes every time he is going to bring an awakening. I am sending you grain, new wine and oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern army far from you, pushing it into a parched and barren land with its front columns going into the eastern sea. And those in the rear into the western sea, and its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Be not afraid, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Be not afraid, O wild animals, for the open pastures are becoming green." Now, when we read this passage, there are those that are historians and theologians that will tell you, well, now this is just referring to the land of Israel in particular. Well, everything in this book is referring to something in particular. When Jesus said to Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, that pertained to Peter. When, when Jesus said... Uh, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. That referred to the apostles, the disciples that were with Jesus in the context of that evening at the Last Supper. Everything in this book refers in particular to someone but this is what you've got to understand because this word was delivered to us it may refer to someone in time and space in a particular manner but it all refers to all of us I said it's all ours all of this book is ours. Every promise in this book is ours. Every prophecy in this book is ours. And when the Word of God says this, that He's going to save our land, I can tell you I read that and I don't see Israel. Let me tell you what I see. I see Denny Duran's home. He's going to save my land. I see Denny Duran's finances. He's going to save my land. I see my children's marriages prospering. He's going to save my land. I see God moving and working in the lives of my children to anoint them and to bring them into their calling and destiny. He is going to save my land. I see him as he begins to move into Shreveport, Louisiana to a city that is on life support. And he begins to drive back the darkness and people that are divided because of racism or socioeconomic status begin to join hands and believe that Jesus Christ can do something even in our city.
city to bring life and revival in the future. He's going to save our land. I look at the state of Louisiana. We're last in almost everything. Our battle cry is thank God for Mississippi. But I want to say that God is able to save our land. I believe that a revival can come like a tsunami. Hey, like a hurricane. Like a spiritual Katrina. And begin to come up through New Orleans and up the Mississippi and the Red River and we can begin to see God do things in our state that no man was able to accomplish who says we're broke. We serve a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he owns the potatoes under the hill. If God begins to move and he begins to work then something supernatural begins to happen that is beyond us. When God says, save the land, I believe that he's talking about America. I believe that he begins to save us in America. I believe he begins to do things that we never thought could come to pass. Now, yesterday was a very special day, a very important day in the kingdom of God. Um, on the East Coast there was uh, something that was uh, called the cry. And there were thousands of pastors that gathered on the lawn, the Lincoln lawn in Washington, D.C. It was pretty amazing. Our own Forever Jones led the charge in worship yesterday. There were white pastors, black pastors, Hispanic pastors. There were Baptists, there were Methodists, there were Catholics, there were, there were Pentecostals, there were Assemblies of God and Church of God, there were Church of God in Christ, there were Presbyterians, just men of God who determined that they would come together on the lawn of Washington, D.C., and they would cry out for a genuine revival. And then on the West Coast... In fact, last night, Denny Rodney and I had a meeting of our own in Lafayette, and we had an opportunity to speak to 250 fired-up college student ministers. You talk about wonderful. We walked into that sanctuary, that auditorium, rather, at University of Louisiana there in Lafayette, and there are 250 kids from LSU and from Tulane and from Loyola and from Xavier and from um, Monroe and, and from Louisiana Tech and McNeese and Delgado Community. Everywhere there's a school in Louisiana, there were students there. And they were all there to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget the moment, honestly, when I had them all stand those that had not experienced the third baptism, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And those kids stood from all over the state, lifted their hands, began to be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. On the way over there, Denny Rodden and I live-streamed the Jones and the great meeting that was happening in Washington, D.C. I'm telling you. It blew us away. On the way back, we live streamed the Azusa meeting that was happening in the Coliseum at USC. Yep. The site of the first Super Bowl ever, the Coliseum. The legendary Coliseum where national championships have been won. And the USC Trojans throughout the years have established themselves as one of the great teams of college football history. That stadium, 100,000 people gathered in that stadium. And they worshiped and cried out to God in repentance, praying for revival. The same message that was taking place in Washington, D.C. was at the same time yesterday taking place in the Coliseum in Los Angeles. Both 
coast in America were crying out for revival. And those services were being streamed literally around the world. The nation of Singapore, its churches, I should clarify, in Singapore, so concerned about revival in America that the churches in Singapore sent a million dollars to the meeting in Los Angeles to take care of the expenses. The night went from intercession and repentance, people crying out in sorrow and anguish to God for the sins of the nation, for the sins of their own lives and generations. You see, let me say something to you. You know when you got cold? When you stopped repenting. Some of you stopped repenting. You don't remember the last time you, you sobbed before God and repented of your sins, repented in anguish. Of, of the things that you've done to violate him. I know that there's a grace message out there today that says this, that once you come to grace in God, you don't have to worry about sin again. Let me say this to you. I, I married my wife, and I told her I loved her when I married her. But I can tell you, in a relationship with my wife, if I violate her in any way, I better say I'm sorry or we don't have a relationship. Look at me and listen to me. I'm not stupid, and neither are you. Everything in the natural world reflects the spiritual world. God created relationships of human beings exactly as the relationship that He would share with us. It's the only image we have of relationship, is the relationship with Almighty God. And every time one of His men sinned against Him, it wasn't about whether or not God was going to forgive it. It was a personal thing. God the Father wanted that one that He loved to come into His presence and to make things right so that the relationship could go on in beauty and in glory and in godliness. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? Do you remember how that that boy took his inheritance and he went into a far land? I want to ask you, did that boy ever stop being the son of that father? No. But was that boy out of relationship with his father? And did that boy write a note Get, prepare a speech that he could give to the father because he was so sensitive to the fact that he had offended the father. Let me say this to you. If the boy would have come back proud and arrogant, I can promise you he wouldn't have been restored to his rightful place in that home. But he came back broken. And it's obvious for you to read there in the story. And in his brokenness, his father welcomed him and restored everything. That's what's happening right now in America. On the East Coast, on the West Coast yesterday, down at University of Louisiana Lafayette, I watched people as they cried out and they asked God to forgive them. As they repented of their sins as they said Lord we want to see a revival Lord we want to see you move in a powerful and a glorious way I wish you could have seen Daniel Kalinda the great young evangelist who Reinhard Bonnke Reinhard Bonnke is an evangelist who has spoken to more people in person than any man on the globe in all of human history. He had a crowd of over a million people standing before him in Nigeria for one crusade. This man has been powerfully used of God to see blind eyes open and deaf ears unstopped and paralytics walk and cancers and gorders fall off as he prayed for them. There are videos that you can see where he has actually raised people from the dead because of the authority that is on his life. And what he did was this. He got to a place in his age where he said, now it's time to turn it over to the next generation. And he turned it over to a young man by the name of Daniel Kalinda. I've known the Kalinda family for many years. He is third or fourth generation Holy Ghost kid. And he stood before 100,000 people last night at the USC Coliseum. And he began to preach. And this is what he said. He said, everyone here needs to be filled with the precious baptism in the Holy Ghost. He had all of those people, tens of thousands, as they stood to their feet. And he said, this is what we're going to do. He said, I'm going to say in the name of Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he said, I want you to shout the loudest 
loudest hallelujah you've ever shouted in your life to the heavens. When they began to shout hallelujah, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I got chills. I have never heard anything like it. I promise you, USC has never in their most glorious moment received a cheer like that in that stadium. They began to shout to the heavenlies and honestly, it was as if you could hear the heavens as they began to shatter and the glory of God began to fall in that stadium. You say, what are you telling us all of this for? Because this is the hour when God is doing something so powerful that we cannot sleep through it. There will be five virgins, which is symbolic of half the church that are going to sleep through the great awakening. There is another group of the virgins which is symbolic of those that have oil in their lamps. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I've lived all my life for this moment. I've lived all my life to see God move and shake America. I've lived all my life to see a genuine revival that will begin to do in a few minutes and a few days and a few weeks and a few months what all of our politicians joining hands have not been able to do in a lifetime. And I am not going to miss it. I can tell you if this is the hour, I don't care where I line up. I don't have to be on the platform. I don't even have to be in the wings. I can be outside. I can be standing on the sidewalk outside the building of revival. But if a little bit of that trickle will just fall on me, a little bit of that wind will just blow on me, all I can say is I'm not missing what God is about to do in the earth. God is about to send a revival. And because God is sending a revival, we're going to see God do something that is beyond anything that we have ever seen, that we have ever thought that we have ever been able to imagine this is God's day hallelujah give the Lord a shout give him a shout hallelujah you may be seated this revival is going to upset some things because we've gotten pretty good at church ladies and gentlemen let me just tell you I'm not interested in being clever anymore I want Jesus to show up. I know it's really cool when things go smooth, you know? Boy, I'll tell you, just one little thing will just bother me. I'll just come in and something's not happening on the screen. I'll just be bothered by it. There's a word smudge. I'm like, why are we fixing that? Somebody be out of line in the worship, and I'm going, they look like they're preoccupied. Somebody's mindlessly playing on the organ. I'm going, you know, get with it. Let me tell you something, folks. When he comes, nobody's worrying about any of that. He's here. We just want him. And I can tell you that's all I want is I want him. And i got to finish this because the last part is the most important. I want you to see what the prophet says. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, O people of Zion. How many of you are ready to be glad again? I said, how many of you are ready to be glad again? Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains in righteousness, and he sends the abundant showers. You know what this is talking about? This is talking about the fact that there are some things in our lives that aren't growing anymore. And the human moisture that we're trying to put on the dead plants isn't doing any good. We have got to have rain from heaven. We have got to have the showers God sends. The threshing floors will be filled with grains. Hallelujah. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. How many of you had some years that the locusts have eaten? Honestly. How many of you, honest, you've had some years. Would you like to stand up right now and just to just accept this promise? Because I'm about to read this. And if, if you'd like to just accept this promise, you've just had some years that the locusts have eaten. Come on, just, just stand right there. Just stand there at attention while I read this. Here's what he says. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. Somebody ought to say a big amen. A great locust and the young, a big amen. 
My great army that I sent among you, I'll repay you. Somebody say amen. amen. You'll have plenty to eat until you're full. Somebody say amen. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you and never again will my people be ashamed. Reach up and get that. That's yours. That's yours. That's yours. Never again will my people be ashamed. And the Word of God says this, then you will know that I am in Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no other. Never again will my people be ashamed. Turn to the person next to you and say, you will never be ashamed again. You will never be ashamed again. Hallelujah. You may be seated. And afterward, I will, again, I will. Everybody say it. I will. This isn't I might. Or when I get around, he says, I will. Afterward, I will. Say, I will. Pour out my spirit on all people. Let me just say something to you about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is an equal opportunity baptizer. You might feel like you're a wallflower. Like you're just hidden in the margins of society that you've never done anything great. Let me tell you something good that you're going to love. This move of God is going to hit you with as much force as it ever hits those people that you so admire. This move of God is for everybody. You know, we, we just feel like there are certain things in the body of Christ that just belong to other people. I mean, come on, I don't, I don't have the Bible knowledge. I, I never had a Bible school education. I mean, come on, I wasn't raised in church. I don't have a mom or dad that ever taught me anything about God. Hey, 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 hey good news. This move of God, everybody's going to get it. Everybody gets it. Everybody gets this move of God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. I hear people that are so hard on the younger generation without realizing that you're the reason the younger generation is the way that they are. We are the reason. Sorry, that's just the fact. The younger generation, oh, they just mock everything. Yeah, they do. They mock moves to, pro to protect the sanctity of marriage. Because they've watched their parents multiple marriages, affairs, and addictions. They mock politicians who claim a Christian ethic, knowing that they're just playing the religious card to get another voting block. Young people mock the church that loudly proclaims their doctrine but has no resemblance to the Christ of the Gospels or the apostles of the book of Acts. You see, the fact is, this is a young generation that is disillusioned and ripe for revival because when you look and your parents don't fill the bill and when your government doesn't fill the bill and your educators don't fill the bill and your drugs don't satisfy you and all of your ideas don't satisfy you and your philosophies fail you at that point you are looking for something and a hallelujah that something is somebody he's the king of kings the lord of lords and he's going to be exactly what our sons and daughters are looking for i love this prophecy because this prophecy doesn't say your kids are going to straighten up hallelujah they're going to stop embarrassing you glory to god they're going to get a job Thank you, Jesus. It doesn't say your sons and your daughters are finally going to go to church. Oh, that's wonderful. It doesn't say that they're going to become moral people. Here's what it says. That when they get into this revival, they are going to go beyond the expected to the supernatural. It says your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. When this revival hits, little children are going to get so filled with the Holy Ghost that 10 and 11 years old, Old, they're going to begin to speak in tongues and interpret and to prophesy. That, that kids that are 13 and 14 years old are going to begin to operate in the word of knowledge. Kids that are 16, 17 years old are going to have healing in their hands. God is going to move in a revival that is going to shake the younger generation that the hip place to be is not going to be in the latest nightclub downtown, but it's going to be to 
apply to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ where the Spirit of God is moving and the rushing river of God is flowing down the aisles and throughout that sanctuary and out into the community. Hallelujah. This is real. God is about to send a revival and it's going to be a revival that falls upon your sons and your daughters. Somebody give the Lord praise in this place. Hallelujah. 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 And I will show wonders in the heaven and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. We're seeing that. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. There are ten ways that those scriptures could be fulfilled according to scientists. Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord... And everyone, say everyone, say that means me, who calls on the name of the Lord to be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Interesting phrase here. Even upon my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now the first and most obvious thing, which is just kind of a sidebar, is the fact that the Holy Ghost gospel is the great emancipator of women. The Word of God says women are going to be used in this last day revival just like men. Somebody says, I hate women preachers. Well, you're in good company. So does the devil. (laughs) But this is what I want you to see here. In every translation, it's the word servants. It's the word servants. I, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in this revival. I, God's going to touch me. I, I know it. I, but I might not be first. I might not be in the first wave. I don't know. Because I want to be a servant. I really do. But I, I think that God is looking for some of you in the first wave. And the reason why is because that's all you've done all your life is serve. You just serve people. All your life. That's what you've done. You know, there are three secrets to promotion in God. And all of them have to do with servanthood. Here they are, very quickly. Number one is this, the parable of the talents. What you do with little qualifies you for much in God's sight. Doesn't mean you can't get much on your own. You just won't get God's much if you're not faithful with the little He gives you. The second thing is what I call the parable of the doer. Remember, Jesus talked about a good master who said, Who will go to the field? And one gentleman said, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. And he never went. How many of you remember this parable? He just talked a good game. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. He never went. And then there was another guy that never said he would go. He didn't say he wouldn't. He just said he, he just, he never said he would go. But he went. And the Lord said, that's my guy. See, God is about to send a move of the Holy Spirit. And the first wave is going to fall not on spiritual big shots. Or maybe people that are on the platform. Or maybe those that have been very visible. You you know where the first wave is coming? To the servants. And here's the third. Those that take the low seat. Those that look for the smallest job around the church, in the kingdom of God, in the neighborhood, and are willing to do it without recognition. God says, I'm going to send a revival, a move of my spirit, and it's going to fall on my handmaidens and my servants is going to fall on my servants first. That's where it's going to fall. Why is it that India has a revival before America? Why is it that South America has revival before America? Why is it that Africa has revival before America? Why? Because they're the least of the least. The Word of God says, I resist the proud. 
but I give my grace. Thank you for joining us. We hope this message has equipped and encouraged you. For current events and other resources, visit ccpeople.com. And remember, the best is yet to come.